Hi, I'm Riley. And I'm Ryder. And, and this, this is my, my dad's, dad's show. show. Hey, everybody. It's Casey Jaycox with The Quarterback DadCast. I want to say thanks to all of our listeners. Thanks to all of our sponsors for all your support. Uh, we are continuing to enjoy this journey together, inspiring dads. But I want to take a minute now to talk about Acme Homes. You've heard me talk about him before, but I'm going to talk about him again. Bob Cumming, former college teammate, amazing leader, amazing uh, home builder. They continue to take so much pride in the work they do, the craftsmanship, the attention to detail. Whether you're looking for a home up in Monroe, uh, up in Sultan, up in Wenatchee, this is where they're doing their amazing things. So many people during the pandemic, as we have the ability to work from home, have decided to move out of the city to try to find homes where there's more acreage. Well, that's exactly what Bob and team at Acme Homes give you. So check out Valley Vista up in Monroe. Check out Daisy Meadows out in Sultan. And if you want to even go to Eastern Washington, check out Sienna Heights in Wenatchee. They're, again, amazing craftsmanship, amazing floor plans. You can visit them at acmehomeswa.com. And if you're interested in learning specifically about uh, listings or uh, mortgage opportunities, contact Jen at 425-308-8082 or Denise at 425-309-2318. So now, why are we doing a new ad? Because we want to talk about a partnership they have with Portage Bank. Kevin Jensen is one of the great lenders over there. He's the senior vice president. He's going to take care of you. And right now, if you obtain a mortgage through Portage Bank, uh, Bob and team and Acme Homes are going to pay f your $500 appraisal fee. I said that right. They're going to pay your $500 appraisal fee by buying a home through them, getting your mortgage through the folks at Portage Bank. So don't don't wait. Now's the time to, to contact Jen, contact Denise again. Jen's number is 425-308-8082. Again, Denise is at 425-309-2318. Visit acmehomeswa.com right now. Don't wait. Thank you again for listening to the Quarterback Dadcast. So with that, let's get right to today's episode. Well, hey, everybody. It's Casey Jaycox with the Quarterback Dadcast. And I want to quickly just make a note. In this interview, you hear me talk about my father at the time when we did record. He was still with us. But as you have learned from the previous few episodes, my father passed away on December 29th of 2021. And I just want to dedicate this season to him. And so with that, let's get right to this episode. Well, hey, everybody, it's Casey Jaycox again with the Quarterback Dadcast. And uh, Power of the Internet's a great tool because uh, if you're curious like myself, and I believe my, my, my next guest, you're fine, he's got some curiosity in him. He's got some wisdom. He's, I'm excited to, to learn from, from him as well. But the, the Power of the Internet allows you to meet, and that's how we met. We met through LinkedIn. Uh, his, uh, his name is Brad Smith. Uh, he's spent the last 25 years as CEO of a company called Stellar Insight, providing executive coaching to CEOs, strategic planning. Um, we're going to talk about adversity. We're going to talk about a story of colitis. We're going to talk about uh, his life as a chemist. I need to know if he's a duck or a beaver. I see he went to both schools, so I don't know which 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 team he's rooting for. So we're going to have to we're going to, have to learn about that. But all that said, the most important reason why Brad Smith is joining the quarterback Dadcast is because we're going to talk about the best job that one can have, which is being a dad. And we're going to learn about his story of, of how he was always striving to be that ultimate leader of his home. We're going to learn from uh, his ups and downs as a dad. Um, of ways we as we as fathers with, with kids still at the home can can really learn from from his story to become that ultimate leader of his house of our households. But without further ado, Mr. Brad Smith, welcome to the quarterback dad guest. Good to be here. Thank you. You bet. Well, in in true QB dad cast fashion, we always start each episode with what are you most grateful for as a father right now? Oh, you got you're gonna make me cry. <laughs> <laughs> um I'm grateful for the two children that I have because they are both willing to learn and still learning. I love them dearly. I am. Um, I'm grateful. I mean, I mean, I've done a lot of these episodes. This will be episode in the 120 something ish. And, and this, when this comes out, Brad, it'll be season three, um, which will be sometime in early January. We're recording in November, everybody, but I'm, I'm grateful for laughter. Uh, last night, uh, my wife and I drove my daughter and three of her uh, basketball teammates up. Um, they have a two hour practice and they do an hour of training. And on the way up, it was torrential downpour, uh, heinous, just bad roads. And I'm like, we could, and the best part about this is we get to take them to hoops, but then we get a date night out of it. So my wife and I went and had dinner. It's a great place. 
picked him up afterwards and the laughter on the way home just warmed my heart and hearing the kids enjoy and then got home my son found this old random radio i don't even know where he found it he was playing christmas music and I, like on a ghetto blaster on his shoulder he was wa- running around the upstairs and they were laughing and it's like i'm just grateful for like being so present on those moments because life's not slowing down so I, i'm grateful for that good good um well tell me about life for brad where where's brad living what what is the what is the uh, what does the family life look like? T- tell us a little bit about, about your kids. Um, okay. So, um, let's see. I'm living in Vancouver, Washington. Just moved back like five weeks ago from Las Vegas, Nevada, because my son lives here in this city and my daughter is in Seattle with her husband and the two grandkids. Um, so that's kind of what's going on. I had the chance to go see my my daughter and the grandkids on um, Sunday. So it's very close, very recent, two days ago. And um, my A plus for being a grandparent and a parent happened during that. Um, I have a four-year-old granddaughter, Isabella, and I have a se- uh, yeah, six, six year, seven-year-old grandson. And uh, as I'm getting ready to leave, uh, first off, I hadn't seen him for 22 months. Christmas 2019 was the last time I had physically seen them, right? So my, my granddaughter was two at the time. So 50% of her life later, she gets to see her, her, you know, her, her mom's dad again, her grandpa. So I go in, I spend time with them, and she was happy to see me. They were both happy to see me, right? And um, I got to thank my daughter for what a good job she'd done making sure that I was part of their life. Because as I was leaving, hugged my daughter goodbye, hugged both my grandchildren goodbye, um, said goodbye to my grandson, or my son-in-law. And as I'm leaving and hugging my daughter at the door, my four-year-old granddaughter runs up, says, Grandpa, I miss you, I miss you when you leave. Mm-hmm. And then she flops down on, on my daughter's feet and says, I miss you, I miss you. So it's like, oh my God, it doesn't right. get any better than that. No, that's awesome. That's awesome. Um, and your, your, so your son, does he have any grandkids yet? I mean, any children yet? Um, he is still single. We have hopes. He has um, <laughs> a committed girlfriend okay. who's way more driven in life. I just turned over parenting to her. She's like, yeah. She's in her third year of law school. He's trying to decide where he's going to go to finish his bachelor's degree in engineering. Done. There you go. <laughs> Done. Um, and are we married, single? Single, looking okay. for wife number three. Okay. There we are. There's, there you there's go. the adventure. Curi- there you go. No, I'm curious and open for adventure. And if you've got those two things, right? Tom Sawyer and Huck Finn were my great teachers early in my life read those two books. It's like, Oh yeah, that's what life is about. Mm -hmm. So very cool. Um, well, I want to hear, uh, I want to, I want to go rewind the time, Brad. I want to hear about what was life like growing up for you. And I want to hear about how your, your father or parents, um, impacted you as a father. Um, I think my dad was a better parent than I am. And he was, you know, I think I'm a good parent, but my, my dad, after my dad passed, I went down and um, we were sitting in the room. My my middle, my younger sister and my youngest brother, the other two siblings, couldn't show up to distract them while they were coming to get my dad's body. I asked them stories. It's like, how did dad teach you? Give me a story. And so my youngest brother's um, story was. Dad gave him a five-gallon rusty uh, milk pail uh, and gave him a a side-angle grinder, right, with a a sanding paper on it and a wire brush and a paint can and primer and all of that. Showed him how to do all those things and then said, I'll be back in two hours to check on you, right? Right. So that's how dad taught us. My story was 
I was 16. I'd had my license for two months. We lived in Corvallis, Oregon. It was a two hour drive, hour and a half, hour and 45 minute drive up to Portland. He gave me a list of 17 places to go, handwritten and the specific things he wanted and how to pay for the things in each one. The first stop was a hardware store where I got a, a box of 100 9 16th bolts, 9 16th washers, 9 16th lock washers, and the, the nuts to go with them and how to pay for it. <clears throat> and then there were 16 more places to go. And he just said, and here's a map, go, and I'll talk to you later. Wow. And so he would challenge us. He'd show us how, but he wouldn't, um, he wouldn't give us, um, he wouldn't do it for us. He made us learn how to do it. He made us invent how to do it. And so uh, both, both my brothers and myself, when we're stuck in a situation, we will look for how, how, how do I solve this problem? How do I lead people to it? And how do I inspire them to get that way? And my dad raised us to be that way. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Which took a lot of patience, a lot of trust. Uh, I think, you know, I think about my generation, we, we, and this is what, you know, COVID was one of the best blessings for us, our family, Brad, is we were doing too much for our kids. Um, we were, we were, you, you're going, and the excuse is, well, we were going to the sports and doing this and doing that. And we had to like, and, and COVID helped me slow down. Like, wait a minute. No, you can do this. And it was such a great, you know, I, I went from like probably doing way too much. Now my son's like a short order cook. I mean, making meals and doing all these things for us. And, um, I, I don't know if it's just the time or generation, but, um, I, I saw on your website, you talked about your dad started, 34 companies? That's part of why I do what I do. Mm -hmm. He started 34 companies. It was like, he was like a one, one man economic development department in mid, in mid Willamette Valley in Oregon. Mm -hmm. So I watched him start 34 companies, kill 30 of them because he didn't have all the pieces in place. But it's like of those three, four, mm -hmm. right, that succeeded, one was sold off and then the other three are still running, you know, 50 years later. So, what, what types of companies? Most of them were chemical companies, right? Or food companies, because he was really deep into that. Um, I watched him invent 1958, 1959, which tells you my age, right? Roughly. I watched him invent, this is how I characterize it, the liquid diet drink industry in, in Indiana. He went to meet Johnson, and the first two products that he brought out were Metrical and Nutriment. And most people that are somewhere in the vintage that I am, right? Well, remember, they were the first two on the market, period. He invented that. And behind that then, the whole protein delivery process, all the protein supplements that we get came from that thought process. So he invented that. That was the household I grew up in. My dad had a bachelor's in chemi uh, chemical engineering and a PhD in biochemistry. And by age eight, he built a, you know, a 20 by 40 lab in one of the outbuildings in the place we live. He had me raising uh, tomatoes in beakers, hydroponics. Um, he had me, we worked. So when the first non-sugar sweetener came out, which was, um, I vaguely remember, uh, Cyclomate, I think, uh, he and I spent three months trying to formulate a sweet, sweet enough uh, diet cola. We failed because it was always bitter, but um, that was the aftertaste. And it's like, no, but that's, that's the household I was raised in. Mm. How to, how to work your way through a problem and invent solutions. Are you familiar with the Socratic method? Yep. Yeah. I love Socratic method. As you're saying this, my mind's going to Socratic of, um, you know, asking questions to help people come to their own re re resolution or so they we help improve critical thinking skills. Um, tell me about mom. What mom do? Mom was, <clears throat> she was trained as a, uh, she had her bachelor's degree in, um, diet, dietitian, uh, essentially home economics, right. For her age. And so she was, uh, and she was a nurse. And, um, then when she started having kids, we stopped, she stopped and was essentially a statement home, stay at home mom. Okay. 
And as you think back to the the journey, you um, if I if I heard you right, so including you, you had four brothers and sisters. Two brothers, two sisters. Two brothers, so one of five. Yeah. Um, t- talk about that that journey growing up. Um, the the lessons you learned from your dad about you know doing, you know doing more things for yourself than them, and creating that that independence. Um, and the relationships you had with your, with your, uh, your siblings and, and how did that impact you as a father? Um, I think siblings are important for your evolution, gives you somebody to argue with, gives you somebody to wrestle with, right. Mm-hmm. But it also gives you someone to have adventures with. So, uh, it depends on how you're built and how you're designed. Right. Um, there were four, four of us, and then there was a nine year lag and my youngest brother is, you know, 14 years younger than I am. So there were older sister, me, younger sister, younger brother, youngest brother, right? Mm-hmm. And um, the process was um, we were in the back of a station wagon driving across country. Those were fun. There were a few moments. Here's, here's two key moments that I'll bring out. Dad, we got a TV, right? And I was in, I think, third or fourth grade, third grade. And uh, my two brothers and uh, my two sisters and my brother that were alive at that point were in there sitting watching TV after school. Dad walks in after the first nine week report card, holds the report cards up and he says, every one of you dropped a grade point. And that's not okay. Put the report cards down on top of the TV, pulls out a wire cutter and pulls the plug out from the wall from the TV, cuts it off at the cord, right? And says, all four of you have to get your grades back up uh, to where they were, right? And if you don't, this doesn't go back on. When it comes back on, but all four of you, not just one of you, all four of you. So we were a team then. So that's that's, awesome. that's point number one. Um, about a year later, we're driving out across the country to go to the West Coast because we were based in in Indiana at the time. And somewhere in Wyoming, I think it was, we were all wrestling back and forth and arguing. And dad said, enough, enough, enough. Everybody gets out and walks. There's this big, big, long hill. He, he, we all get out, said, you're going to walk. So we all four got out. He and mom drove up to the top of the hill and stopped, right? which was a good half mile. And we hoofed it and we were good, I'm sure for at least half an hour. So two key moments. Did I forget the one with the uh, television? No, my come home, do homework, then then play. Mm-hmm. How, um, is it easy to remember all those stories? Yeah. I think I think it's funny how those those we call them flashpoints or memories we have in life that really impact us um, from our parents. Um, so as you think about those two stories, and, and maybe you're going back to the spot, visualizing yourself, and you're there that hill or in that couch, yep. and your dad <clears throat> just snaps the cord, which I love so good. <laughs> I love that. Um, talk about how those moments uh, uh, Im- impacted you as a father, and can, do any stories come to mind of how you had similar parenting oh, okay. opportunities. So, so I'll add one more story. Okay. Dad was convinced that education was the key to a success. He had a PhD. And so if education is the key, we had to learn because he noticed that every one of us was struggling in one area or another. And so we had, he, he bought this process. You're, you're, we're talking the fifties, right? He bought this process where it was a self-learning process where We would have English classes to go to in the summer, right there at home, right? We had math classes to do, right? And so he would have us go through these classes, essentially, before you had online stuff. And we would have to go through and do that. And so because that, the combination of that and the the wire cutter moment, um, I was committed to education and learning. So that was the key, but he had us constantly learning. So um, one day with my son, um, he comes home. I'd separated and gone through divorce with his mom. 
and he would come over and, and st- he and his sister would come over and stay. And every week he had, uh, I think he was in second grade at the time, he would have a spelling list that he had, and it was 20 words long normally. He comes home to my place and he's only got five words in his list. I'm going, uh, what's going on here? And he says, well, the teacher and, ma- and mom got together and decided that since I wasn't doing very well, um, I was only going to do five because that would be enough I could learn. I said, garbage, that's not happening. So we went back to his teacher. We got the list of the full 20, right? I said, but here's the deal, Evan. Um, if you get 100% on your spelling test, what do you want to do as a treat? He said, well, I don't know. We could go roller skating. So for nine out of the 10 weeks in between then and the end of the year, he got he got to go roller skating because he got 100% on his spelling test. Mm-hmm. I proved to him that he was smart and I proved to him that he was capable and all he had to do was have the motivation and the commitment to follow through on it. And so he did. And the last week he, he missed two because he was just bored with going skating. So he wanted to do something else. So I mm-hmm. took him to a movie. So did, did that, um, you know, you got me going off on another tangent. So like, I, I love that story of, um, I, I do work for this uh, the other company. So I'm an entrepreneur of myself, but I also do work for a company called Limitless Minds. And we talk about, um, think big, go far. Mm-hmm. And, um, you, you know, and I believe that I always tell my kids, someone's going to do it. Why not you? Right. Some, someone's going to achieve big things. And I kind of like, as you're sharing that story with your, uh, it's easy to, to keep, keep our, um, goals low, but was also, I think it's our job as parents and dads and moms to help give our kids the ability to dream big and be, and be, and, and think about that job. And I think you did a great job of that, but for like dads that are listening at home who maybe have gone through a divorce and that journey where mom says one thing, dad says one thing to talk about how, how did you work through that? What are maybe it's a, what lessons that dads who've gone through divorce can learn about that. If there may be different views on how to push their kid to, to achieve greatness. Um, so the first thing I've taught both my children is self-awareness. Then I taught them that, uh, curiosity is the best tool. Curiosity and learning is the best tool they can have ever. Right. So, um, yeah, and I have stories. So what I did was I taught my children to be aware of themselves and aware of their surroundings and, uh, to specifically decide given the reality of what's in front of them, the actuality of it, right? Ac- your ac- accurate assessment of the situation, what's true and what's not true, because they get to decide for themselves what's true. Okay. And so once I had that into them, then my job was as parents, it's like pretty much done. It's like, what do you want? Where do you want to achieve? Right. And, and I would describe it this way. My daughter has done a better job at her life than I have. Right. My son is still working on that, mm-hmm. but, um, he's, that's their innate character. And so I, you know, it's like, I told my son at one point, I said, Evan, there's a reason why you picked me as your dad mm-hmm. so that I could help you get better at what you want to do. Mm-hmm. No, I, I like that. I like that, Brad. Um, but, but as you think about like maybe dad, dads who have, who've gone through, through, through divorce where I think, and I think that my, my, my gut says your, your ex-wife would be like, Hey, Brad, I'm so, even though maybe I would, I didn't agree with how I had this view, you had this view, but you pushed him and it, it got us a great outcome. Awesome. Like, is there any stories or, 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 um, tips you might give dads out there who've gone through divorce to help if they maybe disagree with an approach, maybe a teacher or a mom or a partner, whatever it may be that, and you kind of got to that outcome. Cause I think you're the, how you got there was awesome and you helped create some confidence in your son. Well, what, what I did even before the divorce was I made sure that my children knew I loved them period. Right. So starting the first week that I was separated, I was, you know, at that point I had to live with my parents. I drove over, picked them up, took them places. And when I dropped them off the first week, I said, I love you. Right. 
And then the second week, right, that I did that, I would drop them off and I'd and I ask them, how do I feel about you? So that they would repeat out of their own words how how to solve that problem. The other thing that I, you know, how to be aware of that, right? The other thing I did was before the divorce, I recognized that I was um, the separation. I I had differences of opinion in certain things, but I was pretty aligned with my ex-wife on how she parented, right? Yes, she was a little more controlling, a little bit more fearful than I was, and I would go back in and talk. So the first six months that I was separated from my from my ex-wife, um, I went in and put my children to bed every night because that's what I used to do. So every night I went in and then I'd talk to my ex-wife, right? And we would talk through things. And then, and, and I did all the house cleaning chores that were my job for three months. And then I started backing up step by step by step out of the household so that I would, after six months, not need to put them to sleep for them to feel safe, right? But also that my ex-wife, my, you know, soon to be ex-wife was aligned with me on that. So we talked through everything. Mm-hmm. Oh, that's good. Thank you for that. Um, I want to, I want to go back. Cause I thought about this earlier and I just, I want to make sure I ask it, right? With so much, uh, focus on education. Um, your, your dad said education was the key to success. Where did, where did he get that inspiration? I'm guessing grandparents, but were your grandparents also entrepreneurs? No. Well, my, my grandpa, my, his dad was an entrepreneur, right? Okay. Living in a little town of 250, maybe 200, um, in Iowa. And, um, he had bought one business and then added other sections to it because you can't get enough business in a town of 200 with one line of business. So he had things that he added to that. And so he taught my dad how to do that entrepreneurial stuff, which is kind of why, you know, my dad was an entrepreneur, but also an inventor and a product developer all the way along. So that's what my dad grew up into was how to go out and create businesses. Mm, Interesting. Um, I want to hear about, uh, so actually we're going to, we're going to get goofy in a second. So are you a duck or a beaver? How do you, how do you, my, my answer to that is yes. Okay. Right. And for people that don't know the Oregon ducks and, uh, Oregon state beavers, it used to be called, I think the civil war, but they canceled that name. Right. I don't know whether they have or not. I think they need to still, but you know, it's an attitude. Yeah. It's a, it's a big rivalry. Big, um, big rivalry. so, So who do you cheer for? I cheer for whoever's doing a better job on the field. Okay. There right? we go. If they show up, if they show up and do their heart's dead flat best to make sure they've done the best, I I support excellence, period. So if they're both excellent, they'll come they'll 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 flip back and forth, which they do anyway. It's yes. just fun to watch. It's like, oh, we've got a good coach here. This is the result. Oh, now we've got a good coach over here, right? It's a good result. So, hey everybody, it's Casey Jacox. I want to take a quick break to talk about my friends up at Catch Sick of Seafood, who continue to be just an amazing, loyal sponsor. And for those that you've tried it, thank you. For those of you who haven't, you're missing out. And now's the time to make sure that you visit catchsickofseafoods.com and get some of those amazing smoked salmon, get some of that amazing rockfish, blackfish, black cod. Uh, salmon, whatever it might be, whatever you you like. But what, what's great about opportunities they have, now's the time to subscribe to a box so that you're going to get that reliable cadence of the best fish directly from the dock to the doorstep. And what, what's great about Catch Sick of Seafoods, they make it so easy. So those that maybe aren't the best chefs at home, who doesn't matter. They're going to give you this beautiful, uh, nice laminated uh, recipe card that tells you exactly how long to cook it, whether you're going to barbecue, you're going to bake, you're going to fry, whatever, whatever the way you want to do it, they're going to make it easy. So please visit them today, catch sick of sign up for a subscription so that you know, you're going to get the best fish delivered directly to your door. You won't regret it. And just like my daughter Riley says, dad, I don't even like fish. And she does now because of my friends up at catch sick of seafood. So with that, let's get right back to today's episode. Um, I did both of them because I wanted to have a team. Oregon State went through about a 15-year slump, yep, 20-year slump. And so I wanted to have a team to root for. 
right? And so I wanted, so they call people that have both degree, a degree from both, both universities a platypus. I'm not sure about that. <laughs> That's funny. My, so my, I'm a, I went to central Washington university. I played football there. Shout out to uncle Rico, uh, Napoleon dynamite joke there for anybody that was scoring at home. But my mom was a cougar. My dad's a Husky. So I was growing up with the apple cup. I, I was always a down the middle guy. I never, and even to this day, I still, I don't have an a, a allegiance either way. I just like to see good competition. Um, uh, sometimes I root for the underdog, um, in right. those games, but. Right. Um, human beings are capable of, way more excellence than they give themselves credit for. All the miracle workers in the world, all the billionaires, right? All the, you know, the serial entrepreneurs, every one of them have looked inside themselves and said, I want something that's better than where I'm at. Every person is capable of that. And so as a parent, what we get to do is to foster that drive or a thirst for ambition, if you would, for excellence in in our children. And I think teacher of that is the best thing you can do with your kids. So let's talk about that. So I think like one of the things I, I've talked a lot about my friends, um, I've, I've given much love to one of my best buddies on the East Coast named Brett to name, name Burke, uh, Bert, pardon me. Um, we talk about, you know, what is our end game? And it's easy. I think I, I see a lot of parents trying to live vicariously through their kids. I see a lot of parents trying to like make their goals, their kids goals. In the end, we have to, it's, it's not our journey. It's their journey. Right. So when you demand excellence, what are, what are some, what are some tips you might share with parents at home with, with kids who are younger, who have not gone through, you've gone through yet on, on ways to demand excellence or encourage excellence or teach excellence, but not make it your idea, make it their idea. Um, so you can't demand it. Otherwise you're telling them. That's exactly. Right? Yep. Right. You, you can inspire them a key age. I've got two brothers, right. And then, and myself, and I watched what my dad was doing from the age of nine, each of us from age nine to age 14 or 15. And what my dad did during that period of time, each of my brothers and myself have chosen to do for our career. But he included us in stuff and he engaged us in stuff. And so what I what I did with my children was to make sure that I showed them what I did and they knew what I was doing and the things I was learning. I talked to them about my learning and what I was challenging myself with and where I was growing. And so if I talked with them about that and relate the different stories, then they would wind up inspired and they did. Right. I love that. You're making me think of things I'm, I'm doing right now with my kids. What about a time of failure? Talk about, did you ever talk about uh, struggles you had with your kids? With my kids? Well, I talked to them about the aftermath of the divorce. Right. And I talked to them about how they were feeling with that. Right. Mm -hmm. So, um, they both knew the story of my colitis. Right which was when I was 18, um, I developed a bleed, a raging bleeding ulcer. And here's the quote process. It went to the doctor. The doctor looks at me and said, gee, Brad, if you'd have waited six weeks to come see me, you'd have bled to death. So, so he had my attention as an 18 year old. And he said, you'll never eat strawberries, corn or lettuce or anything with roughage ever again in your life. And my 18 year old brain said, fat chance, buddy, that ain't happening. And then he said, you have a psychosomatic disease. Your emotions affect the severity of your symptoms. And in that moment, I didn't have all the answers, but I made the internal commitment to conquer that disease. And people die from colitis, right? They, they die from Crohn's disease. And so I took that on. It took me about a year to stop the bleeding completely. And then, well, to intermittent stage. And then it took me probably another four or five years to get the pain stopped because it was over the top. And then it took me probably another 15 to 17 years to finally understand it deep enough mm -hmm. that I could go back in with hypnosis and conquer it. So I am today capable of, you know, fried eggs in the morning with salt, pepper and cayenne on it. I know no one with colitis that can have cayenne, period. They ought to, but they can't. So... Mm -hmm. Um, that was one of the things I 
my, I, one of the stories I talk to my children about and how they can challenge themselves to overcome their internal limitations. How did you, um, so how, how does, how does one get colitis? Maybe that. Well, okay. So <clears throat> the core of it is the core memory that I went back and adjusted at about 40 was, uh, my first spanking. I remembered my first spanking, right? I'm playing, I'm curious, right? Had the lid off the diaper pail because I had sisters and brothers, you know, with, with, you know, playing in the diapers, swirling around, freaked my mom out really bad. And so she rushes in, snatches me away, spanks me, right? <clears throat> and then washes my hands, right? Well, at that moment, I decided because I was very young, I was probably 12 months old, um, and in the middle of my own potty training. And so I was trying to regulate my intestinal system at that time. That's the onset of that disease. It's the psychological lack of safety from the spanking. I went from feeling unconditionally loved to conditionally loved in that moment, right? And what I had to do was to go back in and rewire that from an adult perspective and say, mom, your mom, you know, mom still loved you. Right. But you were safe because she wanted to protect you. And so rewiring that. But that's the onset. And that memory is what I had to rework. Wow. How, how did you know to do that? A combination of working with a, a, a hypnotherapist. And um, I had this memory, but I'd, I'd reviewed literally my whole emotional history. And I was pretty sensitive and, and, uh, open at that time. And so using that kind of emotionality, I went back and I literally studied all of my emotional history, right? This is this, this is the result. So because I'd been raised to be a chemist, right? I was in actually in chemical engineering at, you know, as my degree program as a freshman and, and sophomore, um, I believed in cause and effect. If there is an effect, there is a cause, period. Okay, it may be psychological, but it's still cause and effect. Now, I've come to the conclusion that all of the issues that people have in this world are, in one form or another, psychosomatic. If you believe you're a victim, guess what? You will never be anything more than just that. So if you go in and look at the core causes of being a victim, then you can overcome them, and then you're no longer a victim, because the core purpose of us is to learn how to be in our own self-authority. Mm -hmm. So that's what I've taught my children is like, be responsible for the outcomes in your life. Yeah. You're, 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 you're talking, you're hitting some stuff. that's um, super important. Um, in, in our, my teammates at limitless minds, we, we have a framework we teach called staying neutral in thought. And then we also teach something called, uh, this was taught to me recently. It's an event plus story equals a response. So event happens, we tell ourselves a story and then we choose how to respond, whether it's victim mindset or the, either the hero, or our own story, the victim of our own story, um, to your point. And, um, I believe this is the, I'm pointing my mind for the listener at home who can't see me. I always tell my kids, it's the most, it's the strongest, most untapped muscle in your body, even though it's not a muscle, but we don't work it enough. You know, and I, I totally agree with you, Brad, that if we, if we, you know, things always happen twice in my, in my mind, once and we see it visualize it and do it. And second, when we actually go achieve it, right. You know, you know, someone, I think about like, imagine like, you know, I don't, I'm not, not go down political path, but imagine if Barack Obama's parents said, Hey, you're going to be the first black president. What? How am I going to do that? I mean, Oprah Winfrey, you're gonna be the first massively successful African-American uh, female host. What? Or, you know, Bill Gates, you're going to go out and ch b build this massive software company. Someone's going to do it. Why not? You know, so I think I, I love where your mindset is of just instilling um, positivity and the, the chance for achieving something because someone's going to do it. Right. Well, I look at it this way. <clears throat> Every human being is built almost exactly the same. We have a mind. We have awareness. We have memory. Right. We have will. We have the ability to love. All of those are key ingredients. Right. And so if you take those key ingredients and you drop them into one human being, why does this human being wind up massively successful one way or the other, right? And this human doesn't, right? 
what's the difference between the two? And almost always it's self-limitation. So I would challenge every one of the people listening first, look at who you are, look at the things you've achieved, congratulate yourself for those, but also what are the things you want that you haven't? What are the things you want your children to achieve, right, mm -hmm. that you haven't? Inspire yourself first and then inspire them second. Mm, I like that. I'll write that down. Hopefully everybody's taking those. Self-inspiring is a key skill. How do people inspire themselves? Well, what's important to you, right? What's important to you and how do you find other people that are also achieving those things, right? Let's say I choose to be a millionaire, right? Um, or I choose to change a social situation. I will look at the people who are doing it and how they're doing it. And then, you know, that inspires me because if they did it, I can do it. No, nope, you know, love it. Look at it this way. Every, how many human beings on the face of the planet do you know? Have you ever heard a story where someone didn't walk because they were too lazy? Nobody. Yep. There are no humans that are physically capable of walking that don't walk, right? How many of us don't know how to talk because we were too lazy to learn? None of us, right? Yep. So find, you know, if everybody, let's put it this way, if everybody on the planet that was a certain level could walk on water, do you think there would be many non-water -walk walkers? No. Right? Mm -hmm. Levitation being the same thing. It's like it's mind over whatever, right? Yep. We haven't, as a general public, learned that skill yet. Mm. Teach, your teach your children how to be self inspiring after you learn it for yourself. Well said. Um, as we think about like your shift from, you know, dad's, dad was into, super smart PhD, raised the chemist, you, and then talk about the, the, the pivot you made where you, you said, Hey, being a chemist is not for me. And then, and maybe just, I'd love to learn how you transition into the work you're doing now. Um, I recognize that, or the way I describe myself is this, I was raised in a litter and I require humans. I'm gregarious. I know that about myself. I require the regular interaction. Um, and so um, I was a chemist, but that was m meant that I was doing inventive things in a laboratory, but I was isolated. There weren't other humans around to interact with. And so when I had the opportunity to do this, I recognized how gregarious I am and how important it was for me to uh, find ways to interact with people and help them uh, achieve their goals. So that transition was slow, but sure. I was shy as a child. I'm still at my core to some extent shy. I'm challenging myself now. It's like, okay, yeah. fine. Let's get out in front of people and talk to people. Yeah. How can I inspire you for you to be better? Also inspires me to be better. Because I can't lead people places I haven't led myself. I think it's, I think it's, I love that because, you know, I, I coaching found me in my line of work too, Brad. And what I love the coaching I do is I, I only coach on things of my own failure or our own success. And, and I get inspiration from coaching others that I wish I had when I was younger in my career, if I was 24, 25 or 30, whatever it may be, if I had, man, I, the lessons I learned or the failure or success I had at that age, I wish I could give that. And then when I get the chance to do it, it massively inspires me. All right. Massively inspires me. So I, I love how you said that. Um, was it hard to let go or was it, was it hard for your dad to see you walk away from that? No, he was, he was pretty happy with that. Very cool. So, because I was being an entrepreneur, that was just fine with him. There you go. <laughs> um, as you think, one question I always like asking dads is we think back on your, your journey as a father. Um, you know, we as humans, unfortunately, we're all flawed. And we, we, and, but when we do make mistakes, we have a choice to, to own it, check the ego, show self-awareness skill you talked about earlier. Um, maybe apologize. We've talked about that on multiple episodes. Power of power of saying your sorry is, is, is I think very important. Um, you know, as you think back to a, a skill in your dad 
game or repertoire of skills. What, tell me what comes to mind of an area that you maybe struggled at that other dads can know that, Hey, I'm, I, I struggle with that too. And, and, and maybe how did you work through it to become better? Um, so speaking of apologies, I went back to both my children and apologized for all for them having demonstrated all of my failures, all of my character flaws, all my weaknesses, you know, and they got to pick which ones they, they were, were theirs, right, to learn from. So I've apologized to them for that, right, repeatedly, <laughs> you know, but I also give them the tools that I learned my way out of, you know, that I learned. Right. So it's like, I learned this. Here's a possibility for you. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's kind of how I've dealt with that. But flaws. Yeah. Um, conflict avoidant, but, um, dealt with things as I got to them. So learned my way from being shy and in my business, terrified of selling to getting to the place where I'm quite easily able to go out and talk with people. Hmm. So w what was there a, a moment that said that gave you the strength to, to go back to your kids to, to have those conversations? Oh, it's always there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like I notice things in them because, you know, with self-awareness also comes other awareness. Right. And if I see them struggling with something, I will acknowledge that that's something they learned from me. And walk through that conversation with them. So it's my awareness of myself, my awareness of them, and the dialogue that I have with my children all the time about where they're headed and what they want. Hmm. Very cool. Um, if you were to think about kind of what we've talked about, which is a lot, and there's a lot of wisdom in this episode so far, as you think about areas um, of, of what we've talked about, your journey as a father, maybe into a grandparent now, if we were summarizing kind of in, into like bite size or actionable tasks that dads at home can, can use what we've talked about today to become that ultimate leader of their home, how would you, how would you describe um, how, what dads can learn from our conversation today to become a better leader of their home? So I'm going to jump into something here. One of the things that I've, I've learned through both my marriages um, was anger is useless. Anger is me giving myself permission to be powerful when underneath it, I think I'm, I've am i decided I'm powerless or and underneath that, I've decided I'm not capable. And so if I stop myself from being angry, what I'm doing is challenging myself to be self-aware. What's the cause of this emotion? And are you going to use that emotion on somebody or learn from it? So that's the start of my process. I use my negativity, all of my bad characteristics. I stop them at the barrier between me and the rest of the world, and I learn from them. It's like, okay, I'm afraid of this. Let's learn from that. Talk to me, fear. What are you afraid of? And what do you believe underneath that? Mm -hmm. I don't Love think that. I answered your question, though. No, I, I like that. Is so anger. I love. I I think it is because anger is a choice. A lot of times, I, I have this piece of advice called "You can be right or get what you want." Focusing on being right is ego. Um, getting what you want is a better outcome. And so I think, like when you when we think about anger, yeah, where does that come from? But I guess I was I was thinking more of like, which is a great first step, uh, I think, for for dads. But as, as you think about in summarizing our conversation, if you're to think about you know one or two areas, if present thoughts that dads can be really thinking about of what we've talked about to be that ultimate leader of their home. What are some things else that come to mind besides that first piece of advice you shared? So underneath that and uh, kind of opposed to the anger thing, you're already strong. Be aware of who you are, okay. right? Be aware of who you are and how who you are affects everybody in the household. Okay. Just be aware of that. Look at the outcome, everyone. It's like the whole household is like a pond and you've dropped who you are and the ripples of who you are going out. How does it impact everybody that's there? So first, be aware of that and then be present, be aware, be present and be calm, but determined to have excellence happen in yourself and then with everyone else. 
everything starts inside you, live from inside you out rather than outside in. Because that's what I learned. You know, I'm a 26 year meditator, which means you stop yourself and you watch. But okay. I started my watching when I was 18. <laughs> hmm. Like, watch Brad, right? So watch, be deliberate. Love that. As a coach now, Brad, do you do you ever struggle with compartmentalizing the, the coach in work and, and just the coach in your personal or family relationships? I would just say I'm a compulsive teacher. When I was a parent, I was a teacher. My goal, here's the thought. Both my children were born. Each of them was born. And my first thought was, here you are. This is who you are. My job is to teach you how to be successful in life and teach you everything that I know that's positive and constructive, right? So that's my job. In my coaching, it's the same thing. No difference. So it's like if someone's near me and I see that they have an issue and I can open my mouth, I will open, start a conversation, say the two sentences I can to help them redirect in a, an engaged dialogue. My goal is for them to be amazing. That's good. You know, no matter who it is, whether they're paying me or whether they're not. If they're if you have a capability of paying me, yeah, I insist on getting paid. Right. Kind of a key 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 part of a business is receiving revenue. Yeah. <laughs> Little details. Um, as you look back on on uh, if you could do anything differently as a father, what would you do differently? Um. I would have written down a list of all my bad characteristics first and gone down through them and worked through every one of them. Who do I want to be would have been more conscious instead of reactive, right? So if you don't want to be reactive or you find yourself reactive, I would have had myself be more conscious and present. That's a good one. That's something that dads, if you learn from that, like, I think like I, I'm very present of my uh, patience. I'm a very competitive person in life. Um, traditionally, I've found and people who are competitive, their gap is patience. And so I have to be very self-aware on when I feel my patience starting to lose. I have to like, I kind of do what you do. I ask myself, what the hell is going on, dude? Why, why are you freaking out? What's, is it really that big a deal? Probably not. Is it my expectations that I have not told someone in my mind I have, but they don't see it. Well, that's my issue, not theirs. So I've really done some, some own self work on slowing down and then just, um, it's, it's almost like, it's almost like this is a kind of football nerd moment here. Like when I played quarterback in college, my, when I, and I was learning the offense, my quarterback coach said, one of these days, the play will slow down. Like you'll, you'll see the defense clear. It will almost be in slow motion. I was like, when is that going to come? I don't, I can't even imagine that. But as I'm so focused on patience, I feel that now I can see it slowing down. So as, as you, you, I tell that story because I love the idea about dads. If you're listening, man, make a list, make a list of things you don't like about yourself, make a list about, and, and it's, it's, it's okay to not be perfect, but it's not okay not to do anything about it. So let's work on ways to, to attack these areas of our game that maybe aren't the best and realize that we're all flawed. We all, we're, no one's perfect. Um, so Stephen Covey start, talked about starting with the end in mind. Love that. Right? If you're a parent, you're the strategic visionary for the household. Share that with your wife. Build a vision between the two of you if you're still married, right? If you're not, fine. But it's like have a vision for yourself. Have a vision for the household and be the teacher and the inspirer. Be the leader, but don't. You know, there's a difference between telling and asking, right? When you can ask, when you have to tell, right? But be the strategic visionary for the household. That, that well, puts you in charge of everything. Love it. Well said. Well, now it's time to go into what I call the lightning round, Brad, where I ask you random questions at the top of my mind. I don't know where these are going to come from, but it's just going to show I have a screw loose from playing college football. Maybe I took too many hits. Your job is to answer these as quick as you can. And my goal is to hopefully get a giggle out of you. You probably will. <laughs> All right. If you were to book a vacation right now, where are you going? The moon. The moon. Wow. Okay. If you, uh, if I was to come to your house for dinner tonight, what are you going to make me? Um, I have a dish. Well, tacos, fried chicken, or 
um, I have a fish dish that I like to make. Okay. Uh, the last, what was the last book you read? I'm in the middle of reading four books. Um, actually five, um, four of them are marketing business related. One is called hook point, which I think is a brilliant book. And the other one that I'm reading for myself is, uh, Babaji and the 18 Siddha tradition of Kriya yoga. And that's okay. talking about that, that inspires me because these are 19 humans that are supposedly become physically immortal. Wow. There's a challenge for you, right? Raise the bar a bit. Right, exactly. If you were to, um, if I was to go into your phone or anywhere you listen to music, what's the last song that will, that will be played? Last song? Oh, um, Enya. Um, what the heck is it? It's, uh, there's two of them I listen to regularly. Okay. Um, we'll call it a peaceful gone. song by Enya. You, yeah, I can, peaceful I can, song by Enya. Right? There we go. Um, if there was to be a book written about your life, what would be the title? <laughs> how did, how did, how did bear with me? And I apologize. Yeah. How, how did GTF you? That's a <laughs> yeah. grow the F, F up. up. Yep. Good one. I love that. How about if there was a movie to be written about your life? It's called How to GTF You. Who would star you in Hollywood? Oh, that's currently alive? Mm -hmm. Or dead. Um, Don't matter. Oh, uh, your pick. Not. I've been told I look a lot like Robin Williams or did when he I was can see alive. That. Yeah. Right? I'd have him. Okay. Funny. Uh, funny. Uh, I think of that Good Morning Vietnam, a little Mork and Mindy. Yeah. How about that flashback? That was um, awesome. Tell me your favorite 80s comedy movie. Comedy movie? Movie. I, go, I draw a complete blank on that. Um, one of the ones that I liked was 16 Candles. Great movie. That was an awesome movie. The Donger Need Food. Um, and then last question. Um, if you were to play, I don't know if you're, are you a golfer? Not. If you were golfing, how about this? Yeah, well, if you my were... relationship with golf is I play every five years, whether I need to or not. Okay. So if you were to play golf tomorrow, mm -hmm. you get three others to play with you. Tell me who's in your foursome. Oh my God. To play golf or to just be with? Be with. You, um, got, four, you got four hours. Who, who's your dream foursome? Um, Abraham Lincoln. Mm -hmm. uh, Benjamin Franklin. <clears throat> And um, uh, George Washington, three How of come? my heroes. What, where, where does that inspiration from them come from? I have studied the inception of this country and the evolution. I, one of my hobbies is cultural evolution and the evolution. How did we get to be the United States? How did the world get to the place where it needed to have the United States? Mm -hmm. Right? <clears throat> so... I, I watch cultural evolution from literally from the Stone Age to the present moment. I've studied all of it. Wow. Well, that would be a, a dream foursome right there. You got some, some powerhouses. Um, Brad, I've really enjoyed our conversation. It's been awesome. The lightning round has come to an end. Um, I did see a little bit of a giggle, even though you might, audience, you might not have heard it at home, but I did see it. Uh, it's been a blast talking to you. I appreciate the wisdom, the vulnerability, the honesty, the stories of um, your life, um, the, the ups, the downs. Um, the I think the, I love you talk about self awareness. Um, I'm very, I think it's some, and, and mainly curiosity. I think it's another skill set I think that a lot of people can can learn from. Dadsy, there's a lot of uh, nuggets that, that he shared with us. I want to take a minute real quick to thank our sponsors continually for all your support. Um, Acme Homes, um, amazing home build in the state of Washington, as well as Catch Sitka Seafoods if we're looking for fresh fish directly from the harbors of Sitka, Alaska, uh, sent directly from dock to your door. Uh, again, I love telling the story about my daughter. She, she called herself a pizzatarian, didn't even like fish. Now she loves fish only from Catch Sitka. So uh, parents, if you're, if you're interested in, in giving them a shout, they're a small business up there that was impacted by uh, covid um, their website is catchsickseafoods.com, so I would encourage you to check them out. But with that, further ado, Brad, thank you, man, so much for joining today. It's been a great uh, honor to learn more about you and appreciate the wisdom you shared. Thank you.